Hi everybody, Mike Harris here from Minnesota MUFON. Today we're going to be talking about our trip that we took last year, 2019, in August to Warren, Minnesota. It was the uh, 40 year anniversary of the Deputy Bell Johnson incident. And um, those of you that don't know, don't know about it, there was a uh, Sheriff's Deputy Bell Johnson uh, 40 years ago, in tw as of 2019, had an incident uh, with a, an unidentified flying object. His uh, police car um, had a shutter windshield. Yeah, he blacked out for several minutes. The clock in his police car stopped for several minutes. And the doctors could not explain why he had retina burns um, on his eyes as though he'd been exposed to radiation. So I'm <clears throat> going to show you here some pictures of our presentation and, and give my presentation, presentation that, that I did when I was up there. Um, here is our Facebook um, page of it, the Facebook page that was put on by the um, people that uh, did the get-together. Uh, the date was August 27th, as I said, of 2019, and that was the 40-year anniversary of the incident. Here's a, uh, another part of the, uh, the Facebook page. Uh, here is the decoration uh, by the mayor, Mara Hanel, the mayor of Warren. Uh, they actually recognized it uh, that day as being um, official UFO day, commemorating that incident. Here's a flyer um, that was sent out before it. Uh, I got my name on there along with uh, William, Bill McNeff, and Dean, who went up there. And uh, Chris Rutowski was there. He's from Canada. He was the first investigator to go up there at that time when the incident happened. Here's another page of the flyer. Here is the uh, police car that was involved in it. And uh, here's the uh, next page of the flyer. Uh, you see uh, the name Sherlyn Myers there. She's the one that was from the museum that contacted me on the uh, group that we're on on the internet and invited us to come down. Uh, you also see the name Peter Bauer, who was the uh, police dispatcher that took the call uh, from Deputy Johnson when that happened. And you also see uh, Chris there from Canada, as I mentioned before, who was speaking. We uh, checked in the hotel up there, and I uh, happened to see a newspaper face down on the table. I flipped it over, and there we were on the front page of the paper. So that was pretty neat. I just, like I said, found out by chance. Uh, there you see Chris here that spoke uh, before, some pictures of me, Dean, and Bill. Here's a picture I took of the police car when I was up there. Uh, there you can see a little bit of the uh, windshield damage there on the front of the car. Here's a close-up of the windshield coming up right here. You can see a little bit more detail. On uh, the next slide, it's even closer. You can see even more detail of the uh, windshield. This is untouched and unfixed since that incident uh, 40 years ago as of 2019. Here's a, a panoramic shot of the crowd. There were about 400 people there. Uh, people came from all over. There were even people there from Germany. And as you can see, um, it was quite a turnout. They had no idea if they were going to have hundreds of people or, or 10 people, and they had a lot of people. They actually were worried about what they were going to do with the car uh, with all the people there, and they did make room for the car with the, uh, the big crowd. Here is uh, the mayor again, Mara Handel speaking, welcoming us and everybody there to that. There was also a uh, a news article that was mentioned. Here's our Facebook page. And um, they didn't mention MUFON, but um, we made it um, to the newspaper. And um, we were also interviewed, or rather we were mentioned on KFN Radio and uh, KFGO. Now regarding the speakers, here's uh, Chris Rutowski again from Canada talking. And here's a, a picture of me speaking, doing my presentation. 
And uh, I'm going to right now go over my presentation that I did for you um, at that get together. The first one is MUFON case 7320. It was submitted on July 26, 2007 and took place in Wilmar, Minnesota during the summer of 1991. As reported by a male who was born in 1977, making him 14 years old at the time. He reported waking up on a ship during the night in a dark room with two doorways and being held, being held on a table two or three feet high, surrounded by an orange fog. A short guy, in his words, with a hooded trench was there for a few minutes and a guy in a darker but not black hooded trench robe was also there. He, referring to the alien, wouldn't say much. I was yelling and screaming, these are the words of the witness, scared and was really mad too. Uh, then I remember the first half of the incident and how I got there and the whole thing involved being taken by several beings and fighting against them. Then they did some tests with, medical, uh, with metal things like a, a dentist would, but no cords or machines or anything else in the room. And techno noises in the background. Then, after a few hours, they took me back. The short dude, in his words, had dark bluish wrinkled skin and was very stocky and squarish, exactly like you see in other stories. Was maybe three feet of that, and the tall one was four feet and a quarter maybe. At the time, I was five feet tall. The tall one, near the end, took his hood off, and he was a goblin with gray skin, pointy ears, and a round, wrinkly head. I did see a second one for a few minutes. The only things they said were to the effect that they were going to do whatever they wanted. They had a bad, don't care attitude like a doctor doing tests, working for a bad dictator like you see in the movies. There's some more to it, but that's an outline for you. The young man then expressed an interest in wanting to meet one of our investigators who was a certified hypnotherapist who made the following notes. Contact your witness after being assigned this case. The witness was not willing to give his name when I first talked with him on a friend's cell phone. I took no further action on the case at that point. Then on September 4th of 2007, contacted by a witness with request for follow-up. He indicated that he wanted to undergo hypnosis. Planned to interview him and, got, and, to get, and get follow-up on information for his report. September 12, 2007, interviewed witness. Witness described this encounter in detail, also described an extensive life his history of encounters. This report, this report is based only on cognitive, meaning pre-hypnotic recall. <coughs> Regression details are not included in this report. He awoke to find himself surrounded by an orange fog as he lay on a table, approximately two to three feet in the air. He laid on his left side, tilted roughly 20 degrees to his left, his right side approximately four inches higher than his left. The fog was all around him at a distance of a few inches. He felt he had been there for quite some time on the order of hours, as if he had awakened already in this place. The room was darkened with a wall in the distance. There is one wall in the direction of his feet. Toward the corner of the left edge of the wall, there is a door. He knew there was something underneath him, feeling cushioned, but was unable to tell what the material was. He indicates that the fog felt cold, but was not damp. He didn't feel that the fog was water vapor, but more like a gel or a gas. He felt immobilized, the fog appearing to hold him in place. He felt as if he were held by a field or a rubber effect. He describes that he was able to briefly move his head to one side or another, but as he did, the resistance would increase, forcing his head back. Through door A, the, quote, guy in the hood, unquote, entered the room. He realized that he was awake and appeared to get mad at him for being awake. He responded by yelling and swearing at the top of his lungs. The bean was now standing in the room near him as he was yelling angrily. The bean left and returned a moment later with an instrument that could, he could not see. Then another bean and a cloak entered through door B. This bean was shorter, approximately three and a half feet tall, 
and appeared to be subservient to the first entity. The first being left and returned a third time, and the two talked among themselves. The short being also leaves and then returns. By this time, he had calmed down and was able to talk without yelling. He started trying to talk with the shorter being, just trying to get him to give a little bit of information out of the being. However, he was not able to get too much information. He felt that the little being was supposed to do what he was told. He also indicated that the little being was a bully, having the attitude of a clinical indifference. At that point, he began to recall the early moments in the, and the future hours of the abduction. He recalled that he initially awoke to find four or five small beings entering through the closed window. None of these wore hoods and appeared to have black eyes, classic small grays. They had four or five fingers, it was not clear, with sharp nails at the tips. He remembers being scratched by at least one of them. He also remembers at one point being punched as he tried to fight them. He noted the light in the sky outside his house. Then he was aboard the object. He does not remember any other details of the transition to the interior. He felt the immediate sense that the beans in this place were evil. He next remembers lying on the table in the dark room with the 200 beans nearby. He felt that they had initially tried to fight them. At that point, one of the beans produced a metal pin-sized object, stabbing him in the left side of his abdomen, about halfway from his navel to his side. He indicates that he couldn't initially feel the object, but a few seconds later, he felt a lot of pain, like internal electricity. Then, the bean inserted the same instrument into his head, the top of his forehead, in the same way. He describes feeling two or three different types of pain. Then the bean left briefly. He felt that it was domineering as it continued to conduct medical tests. It did a scan of his body that appeared to be some kind of cat scan-like object. At approximately that point, the bean tried to put him to sleep using a pen-like instrument. His memory blanks out temporarily and appears to resume at point B, his initial point of awareness during the abduction narrative. And note here, the account is now at point C in the timeline which is immediately following his recall of the initial events of the abduction. At that point, he indicates that the teller being removed his hood, he noted that his face appeared to be resemble what he felt was a goblin. It had grayish wrinkled skin, a round head, and long pointed ears. His eyes were dark, black. To him, it was clearly not human. He described that there were more to the eyes. They seemed foggy, like something you would see in a horror movie. He knew that his questions wouldn't be answered, he again felt mad. The shorter being also re-entered the room with its hood off. The head looked like a classic small gray, he could not tell the color of the skin. The short being walked up to him and seemed to indicate that he would be leaving soon. From that point on, he didn't know what happened. He does have the vague impression of being carried on a ramp from the ship, carried back into the house. His next memory is of being back in his room. He woke in his bed, soaked in sweat. He got up and turned the lights light on and awoke his sister. He also looked downstairs, looking out the front door and seeing nothing unusual. <clears throat> he remained awake for an unknown amount of time after the event, perhaps for the entire remainder of the night. He indicates that when he awoke, the stab spot on his side remained painful for a couple days, so are both inside and outside. He also felt so sore on the forehead area where the instrument had been inserted. The pain in both locations was about four to six out of ten. He recalls taking two or three ibuprofen sometime later. He also indicates that he felt completely worn out, waking up in a cold sweat. It is not clear what the weather was. This was not, not obtainable since we don't know the exact date of the event. It is also not clear what he was wearing during the abduction. It does appear that he was naked during the event and may have been wearing his night clothes. This point remains to be clarified. Conclusion, the description of this event is taken from the pre-hypnotic interview. The events appeared to be a quaint description of a remembered event. The results of the regression are consistent with the pre-hypnotic description and contain the same material with increased detail. The hypnotic material is not included in this report. I must conclude that he is describing a biographical memory of an event 
I classify this event as an unexplained close encounter of the fourth kind. And those are the words of the investigator. And here is an edition by William McNeff, uh, dated um, August, um, dated of uh, February 27th of 2013. The witness recontacted MUFON via CMS, a reporting system, and recounted uh, three UF sightings, three UFO sightings that did not um, involve entities. He asked that the original report be updated with a revised write-up, which he emailed to me. Here is the new version. Alien abduction, 1991, maybe March. When I was asleep in my upstairs bedroom, I suddenly felt like beans were coming in through the wall. There were about five of them, and it felt like there was a ship, UFO, outside the wall above, maybe 30 feet. I couldn't see the ship, but it made a noise sort of like an engine and had white, bright orange light shining up a lot of the windows. They were somewhat dark colored, about four to four and a half feet tall, semi-thin, had claws, looked like human demons, little hair, and exceptionally strong. This was either another dimension or spiritual. They came through the wall without affecting it and started grabbing me. I struggled and got away from a few of them, but didn't get anywhere before they overwhelmed me and carried me through the wall. From exiting the wall, I became unconscious. Next thing I knew, I was on a med medical type table in a dark room. I was in an orange fog tilted lengthwise and in a dark room unable to move. In the background, there were techno noises. Two doors and a wall panel type machine next to one door on the floor about 2.5 feet tall. I kept trying to move and the fog wasn't letting me. My right side was hovering maybe five inches above whatever type of bed I was on. I got away from my head some. There is a weird time change where the middle part happened first, and then I remember the first part and the last part happened. So when I woke, when I, so when I first woke up, it was the middle of the night. I was rather, so when I first woke up, it was the middle of it. That's because they knocked me out and I woke up a second time thinking it was the first time because they also tried to wipe my memory. There were a couple of beans in trent, dark trench coats with hoods hiding their faces and a short stocky guy in a trench coat. They all had their head covered when they came and went talking to each other out of the doors and going back and forth to each other and me doing some sort of test. I was very mad a lot of the time. I was on at them about who they were and what they were doing and that I, when I got free, I kick, quote, their asses like crazy. During the middle of it, they knocked me out again and then moved me to another room. I didn't remember after that that I had seen all the tall guys' faces because they were wearing their robe hoods during the first one, one third of the time. The taller, skinnier one seemed to boss around the short, stocky one. Afterwards, the skinny one left again. The short, wide one took their hood off and talked nice to me. His face was wrinkled square and blue dark. The skinny one was angry at me for being angry with him. He reacted by taking uh, talking in a controlling and threatening way in English. Then he jabbed me with some kind of dentist looking instrument. At other times they used a similar tool on my head. After that, he didn't say much to me. They were out of the room maybe about three quarters of the time through the whole event. I remember what happened during the first half. Later on, near the end, the thin one took off, took off his hood and he was a gray goblin. I was then unconscious again, but I felt like a freight type door and ramp was open that I might have gone out of. When I woke up at maybe 4 a.m., I was physically in a weird state, sweaty, cold, my head hurt, and I had scratch mark marks on me. That is the end of the revised account. I'd like to add a few comments that I um, added to with uh, the presentation. A lot of people have a uh, Experiences like this are extraordinary and may also have memories of things that are not as outstanding. Um, I interviewed a man in Minnesota a couple years ago who reported some seen, seen, uh, seen lights in the sky that appeared to be satellites, but they zigzagged. And at the end of the interview, 
I asked him if he had any other experiences, and he talked about having missing uh, time in California driving a few years ago. A lot of people don't seem to put uh, two and together because they're made to forget or block it out. The next case here was submitted uh, on July 14th, 2008. It is believed to have happened in July of 1981 in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. The witness and friend noticed an orange glow in the woods. That they thought it might be a campfire, so they went to investigate. In a clearing in the woods was a large disc-shaped object emitting an orange glow, and it was totally silent. The boys ran home. They later looked over their, out their bedroom window and saw a three-foot diameter ring of light on the ground. Nothing above shining the light onto the ground, just a glowing ring of light. Then they saw two things run by the lights. They were on two legs, about three feet tall, skinny, with big heads. And this individual also reported having a sighting in Hawaii in the military, which goes back to people having extraordinary experiences and then remembering ones that are not as outstanding. Uh, the third and last case here was actually, actually happened at the Mall of America. States, this is my second MUFON report. My first report entitled Equilateral Triangle UFO is case number 102192. This event occurred during inclement weather sometime in 2016 or 2017 between the hours of 11 a.m. and 6 p.m. Central Time. During brittle Minnesota winters and sometimes on rainy days, my wife and I walk indoors malls so we don't have to deal with the elements. One of the malls we visit is the Mall of America at 60 East Broadway, Bloomington, Minnesota. Walking the Mall of America takes us 15 to 25 minutes per level depending on how crowded the mall is. On one occasion we walked the first two levels and were on the third level then stopped into a store we frequent and I will not put the name of the store in here but uh, it was the second store that they had gone to when we exited the store, we turned left, planning to continue walking the intersection of the mall's third level. Yet, after taking only five to ten steps, we find ourselves walking by the store's entrance again, but this time from the right side of the entrance. It was as though we had walked the entire intersection of the third level in fewer than two minutes. Astounded, we ask each other, did that happen? My adrenaline kicked in immediately. I remember wildly looking around in all directions and inside of the store to see if others had seen us teleport, rematerialize, or had seen some type of light or energy beam. No one appeared to have noticed anything unusual. Everyone seemed to be going about their business. Immediately, we started discussing the event. We talked about not knowing what had happened and wondered if we were different somehow. We tried to figure out exactly how much time we had lost. Since this event was a shared experience, we both believe it could have not been considered two individuals having separate mental breaks. According to the Mall of America fact sheet, the mall has 40 million visitors annually. Has this happened to others there? This event expanded my reality and shifted my perception of contact and missing time experiences. I realize that these experiences do not only happen in one's apartment or home or on a remote stretch of road while driving at night. Missing time experiences can happen in the most crowded of all places. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, we're going to show you a few more slides here um, from the presentation we did up there. Next one right here, you've got uh, Dean speaking. You see the car and some MUFON people in the front. Here's a close-up of Dean doing his talk. And uh, the next slide here is Bill McNeff doing his presentation. And here is a panorama view of Bill speaking. See there are about 400 people there, like I said, in the car in the front. And here is a picture of Bill, the, the mayor, Marl Handel, again. I'm sorry. 
That was um, that Cheryl Lynn. That Cheryl Lynn is the one that invited us up there. She's the uh, woman from the museum. And uh, at the end, a lot of people came up and asked us questions. Yeah, here's a picture of me and a, uh, one of the guests up there, Anita. She's from uh, Minnesota, wearing the shirt that I bought that they uh, had out there commemorating the incident. Uh, the sheriff's name uh, that was there, he was the sheriff who was the supervisor of Deputy Johnson at the time. His name is Dennis Brecky. Here's a picture of me and the sheriff and the car in the background. And here's a picture of the uh, few of us, Dean and Bill, and the car. And here is one of all of us that went up there with the car. You've got uh, Dean, me, Bill, and Anna there on the right. Helped us a lot driving to the area, which was very nice. Thank you, Anna, for doing that. And now on the uh, last slide, I'm going to show you is very interesting. Uh, when the meeting was over, we were all looking for a place to eat. So I got my cell phone out and I uh, Googled restaurants in the area. And unfortunately, for some reason, it was not able to give us any restaurants in the area. There was some kind of problem. And I did not make this up. This is not a joke. This is really what uh, was on my screen. This is the actual screenshot of my cell phone when we were leaving. It said, could not get this info. Nothing mysteriously, mysteriously stopped maps from searching this area, and there's a picture of UFO. So, go figure. This is part of a presentation given by Minnesota MUFON at Warren, Minnesota on the 40th anniversary of the Val Johnson UFO encounter, August 27th, 2019. Let's go back to the very beginning of Minnesota. The first recorded UFO sighting for what was then the territory of Minnesota took place on October 12th, 1788 at Prairie du Chien, now in Wisconsin. Unusual nocturnal lights were observed at a fur trade site by Robert Dixon, a fur trader. Unfortunately, we have found no other details, but we can assume that it was something very unusual to cause a fur trader to report it. Case 102684. This event happened on or about May 24th, 2019, near Norman Township in Pine County. The witness wrote, my neighbor just bought a new side-by-side, -side, uh, an all-terrain all vehicle with two seats. And he stopped over to show me and give me a ride. We live next to a state forest with some ATV trails. I figured since the sky was so clear, I'd grab my laser and point out some stars later. We took off around 10 or 11 p.m. and ended up down a logging road in C.C. Andrews State Forest. At the end of the road, there is a clearing loggers use to clear um, uh, for, for loading trucks. It hasn't been logged for a few years, so it makes a uh, nice spot to stop and have a beer. So as we stopped, I began talking about how nice his machine was. I pulled out the green laser I brought. I shined it up toward the sky and pointed at a star. My friend was blown away that you can see the beam from the laser so well. As I was pointing it around, we noticed what we thought was a satellite. I pointed the laser at it and it changed positions. We both started freaking out. After a few seconds of it moving around, a second light appeared just to the right of it. My friend at this point is like, give me that thing. What the hell is that? So I hand him the laser and as he points it up at one of the satellite looking lights, a military jet flies right over our heads, way lower than I've ever seen one fly. So we put the laser down got spooked and headed home. Now I can't stop looking at the sky. 
we still talk about what the moving light uh, lights could have been and why the military jet flew over so fast. Case 68-538, Minot, North Dakota. On the morning of October 24, 1968, shortly before 2.30 a.m., a camper team at the Oscar Six Minuteman silo north of Minot saw a large glowing object land nearby. At 2.30 a.m., a missile maintenance team en route to November 7th silo reported a light pacing their vehicle. When they arrived at N7, the UFO was circling to the south. Soon, facility for controllers in a 40-mile wide area were reporting sightings of an object. Personnel at three silos de described seeing an object. One saw the object separate into two parts and return and pass under each other. One two-man security team followed the object to within half a mile of where it landed. At 3 a.m., a B-52 was returning to Minot Air Force Base from a 10-hour training mission. The base radar had picked up a UFO in the area. Ground controllers asked the crew to look at 1 o'clock for an orange glow. At 3.52 a.m., the controllers told the crew the UFO is being picked up by the weather radar now. The B-52 radar picked up a large echo three miles away. At that point, the radar navigator turned on the radar, radar scope camera, which automatically took a photo of the scope every three seconds. The UFO then closed the distance at a speed of at least 3,000 miles an hour, quickly decelerated, and was pacing the B-52, now one mile away. The UHF radios on the B-52 were unable to transmit during this close approach to the object. The object then faded from radar, indicating it had either moved above or below the radar beam. Shortly after that, the B-52 was vectored by the base radar approach control to overflow a huge glowing object at ground level. When the B-52, at an altitude of about 1,000 feet, overflew the object, the co-pilot, Captain Bradford Runyon, saw the object and later made sketches. The main body was elliptical and glowing red-orange with a short, shiny tube extending from one end, which was supporting a yellow-green glowing crescent shape. He described the craft as at least 200 feet in diameter, and scaling the sketch shows the craft was about 500 feet long. Once again, the B-52's radios would not transmit during the close approach. The B-52 executed a U-turn, headed back to Minot, and landed at 4.40 a.m. When checked later, the radios functioned perfectly. A little later, at 4.49 a.m., at the Oscar 7 silo, both the inner and outer alarms sounded. A security team was dispatched and discovered the front gate had been unpadlocked and an access hatch was standing open, but no other evidence of intruders. Of note is that the Air Force investigation that followed these incidents, Blue Book investigators did not interview the B-52 crew members during the official investigation. This gives us a clue as to what the Project Blue Book really was all about. It was primarily a public relations gambit, and the investigators were looking for all possibilities of explaining these reports other than the obvious, advanced flying craft from who knew where. This case has a wealth of evidence, including an object visible simultaneously on three different radar sets, the B-52 radar scope photos, multiple electronic effects, sophisticated opening of high security locks on the missile silo, and documented visual sightings by multiple personnel, about 18, who were responsible for the nuclear defense of the United States. 
It covers about 100 pages of microfilm in the National Archives and is well documented on the internet. The Air Force never explained these incidents satisfactorily. The only approach to an explanation of Project Blue Book uh, in the National Archives is possible plasma, unquote. This is not a good explanation from the electrical standpoint because plasma, like many natural phenomena, assumes a spherical form when unrestrained. It does not have an egg shape with a silvery tube bearing a glowing yellow-green crescent extending from one end. The Minot UFO remains unidentified. These next cases took place in Rosemont and Invergrove, Invergrove Heights, southeastern suburbs of the Twin Cities. The witness cited and photographed objects on four different dates, case numbers 87957, 87958, 88579, and 9809. The witness lives in Rosemont. In most of these cases, where I quote the, the witness's written account, I've done minor editing for clarity. The witness writes, it was 10.30 p.m., August 4th, 2017. I was in the roundabout of my townhome complex. I looked up to see a black object with a bright orange light coming from the bottom of it flying over the community center. It was traveling west to east. I followed it by car. I took out my cell phone and took pictures. Then I followed it down Connemara Trail going east. It stopped and hovered a mile down. I then took another photo. It took off headed southeast as a fireball for about 39 seconds before going into the clouds, which I videoed from my cell phone as well. The photo which the witness took from Connemara Trail shows a craft with a flat bean-shaped bottom glowing a bright orange. From an upper level of the craft, 12 beams of orange light are coming down and shining along the sides. These beams seem to end or fade out near the bottom of the craft. This is one of the best photos of an unidentified flying object that I have ever seen. The witness estimated the object was about 60 yards away from him at that point. Case 87958, September 6, 2017. The prime witness saw a similar craft again in Rosemont. Here is his description. My wife and I, along with our daughter, were traveling west on Connemara Trail toward Highway 3 when I noticed a very large black object with a bright orange light to the south near Highway 3 hovering above downtown Rosemont. I then took pictures. Then we turned south on Highway 3 to see if we could get a closer look. As we approached Highway 42, we could see three black objects with orange lights hovering about treetop level on the south side of 42. There were planes and helicopters flying in the area near them. Then two of the objects flashed red, and the, the one in the middle turned into a large fireball and descended to ground level. As it was descending, it looked like it ejected three smaller orbs. Then down at ground street level, it flashed on and off. When my wife and I drove toward it and passed the spot, it descended. We couldn't see anything on the ground. We turned east and then left, and were then traveling north on Biscayne when we saw one of the objects, now in fireball form, traveling north parallel to us on the driver's side. We followed it until it took off at a high rate of speed and flew out of sight. His wife was driving and the witness was able to take video during parts of this chase, which show objects that appear to be similar to the object he photographed on August 4th. Case 88579, September 8th, 2017, 11.42 p.m. The witness was driving to work through Invergrove Heights. He writes, traveling on Highway 55 headed east, I exited off of Barnes Avenue and noticed a black object with a bright orange light passing over the Barnes Avenue bridge. The object proceeded east 
passing over the Highway 55 and 52 junction and passed by the Invergrove Heights water tower, probably within 20 feet of the tower. I traveled Highway 52 North and got onto I-494 East. As I was crossing the Wakota Bridge, I saw the object again crossing over buildings and a car dealership very close to the bridge, heading now north northeast. As I crossed the bridge, I lost sight of it, and as I proceeded on I-494 North, I realized a large helicopter was now traveling parallel to my direction on my right. It traveled that way for about half a mile, and a mile and a half, and then I lost sight of it. The witness snapped a number of still photos and also took some video. The video shows a moving object emitting a flashing light about five times per second, definitely not typical of a conventional aircraft. One wonders if the helicopter was there because of the unidentified object. The witness had an opportunity to triangulate the distance to the UFO because the car was moving, so the witness was able to say with some certainty that the UFO passed by the Invergrove Heights water tower, probably within 20 feet of the tower. Based on that and the known width of the water tower with trigonometry, I was able to calculate that the UFO was about 60 feet wide based on his photo. This was certainly no drone or conventional aircraft. Case 80, rather 9809, March 12, 2018, 11.54 p.m. Again, the witness was on his way to work. Here's what he wrote. At 11.54, I was traveling east on I-494. As I was approaching the Wakota Bridge, I observed a bright orange object flashing different colors at moments. As I came closer to the object, I realized it was the same kind of flying objects I have spotted in past sightings. It was traveling east. Then it seemed to move southeast. As I continued to travel on I-494, I observed what now appeared to be the flying object, now traveling parallel to my car, on my right, traveling north, possibly about a mile east of me. As I exited off the Valley Creek exit, I no longer had sight of it. When I got to work and was walking into work, I looked up and saw a bright light moving above the tree line traveling north. I had to go into the building to start work so I could not see where it went. He shot three minutes of video while driving. On the video, this light appeared to be steady rather than blinking. It did grow in apparent size during the video, indicating that the witness was getting closer. Unfortunately, there are so many people shooting videos and photos of UFOs on their cell phones these days that MUFON has an embarrassment of riches and the one to two people serving MUFON as photo analysts have fallen behind on analysis and have not yet studied the compelling videos and photos taken by this witness. The witness had an excellent camera in his phone and I expect that when these photos and videos are studied they will be recognized as being significant. MUFON is in the process of setting up a larger, larger photo analysis group, which should help a lot. The Midway case, July 5th, 1988. Nine years after the Val Johnson incident, this case involved a two and a half year old boy who had a supposedly imaginary friend he called Bug Eye. The family of two parents and three children lived in a two-story house in the Midway District of St. Paul, so-called because it is roughly halfway between downtown Minneapolis and downtown St. Paul. I'll give the family pseudonyms. The children were a boy, Keith, 13 years old, a girl of six, and a boy, Carl, two and a half years old. For a couple of months, Carl had been talking about his friend Bug Eye. The mother assumed that it was an imaginary friend, typical of children about that age. In July, in the summer of 1988, the father was away from home and the rest of the family had gone to bed upstairs. The mother was awakened a little before midnight by the sound of two footsteps running around downstairs. 
She recognized one foot of Seth's footsteps uh, as Carl's and assumed the other footsteps were her daughter's. She said that ordinarily she would have gotten up and gone downstairs, but this time she simply shouted, get back up here to bed, and unaccountably went back to sleep. About 1.45 a.m., she was awakened by the sound of uh, someone plunking too tunelessly on a ukulele. She immediately got up and went across the, the hall to Carl's room where she found him in his bed plunking on the ukulele. This ukulele belonged to Keith and Carl was not supposed to touch it. In fact, it was kept downstairs on a high shelf above the refrigerator where it was assumed Carl couldn't get it. Here's the ukulele up on the shelf here, above the refrigerator. The mother took the ukulele from Carl and went downstairs. There she found the lights on and was surprised to find the back door, which they kept locked at night, standing open and the screen door unlocked. Also, the backyard light was on. In lieu of a deadbolt, they used to stick a large kitchen knife into a slot in the door frame, but the knife had been removed. She also found a chair pushed in front of the refrigerator with a footstool sitting on the chair. Now she was thoroughly alarmed. She closed and locked the doors again and went back upstairs. She took Carl to bed with her. They did not go to sleep immediately. She was turning the events over and over in her mind, trying to make sense of them. When there was a loud bang, like an explosion, seemingly outside above the house. At that point, Carl said, he's back. She said, who's back? Daddy. Uh, Daddy? No, Carl said. Bug eye. Now she was even more nonplussed. But eventually they went to sleep. The next morning, his mother noticed that Carl had a light scratch covering about a fourth of his upper back in the shape of the Greek letter Omega. Carl complained that his ears were hurting. The mother, fearing an ear infection, took him to the pediatrician who looked in his ears and said they looked a little red, but he didn't think it was an infection. This proved to be correct. Later that day, the mother called her friend Lynn, who had been reading books about the so-called alien abductions, who told her, this sounds like one of those abduction cases. She came over to the house, bringing with her the book Communion by Whitley Strieber, which features a sketch of a bug-eyed alien on the front cover. She laid the book on the coffee table, and when Carl came by and saw it, he said excitedly, pointing at it, my friend, based on the cover of Communion and some other information, I think Carl's friend may have looked something like this. Carl then ran outside looking for his friend all over the backyard, stopping in certain places and looking up at the sky. He told them that his friend had come into the room and they had gone out into the backyard. He showed them the place where he said his friend had taken him. While he was standing in this spot, he got a strange expression on his face and clasped his hands and twisted them into an odd shape and kind of swayed around. He told them that his friend had told him, the moon loves you, the stars love you, and light loves you. He also said his friend had gotten the ukulele down for him. This really got their attention and they began to think that something really unusual had happened. Lynn knew that MUFON was a UFO research organization which was beginning to look into cases of alleged aliens. I was MUFON state director for Minnesota at the time, and Lynn eventually called me and gave me an account of what had happened. I called the children's mother and made an appointment to visit. On the appointed day, Lynn was also present along with the mother and the children. The father was away working. The two women recounted the events. After this summary, I turned on my tape recorder and the adults and I began to question Carl. He answered our questions readily enough, 
but his memory of the incident seemed to be fading. I have a transcript of the questions and answers. After we had asked a number of questions, we set a chair in front of the refrigerator and put the footstool on top of it, just as it had been the night of the incident. We asked Carl to climb up and get the ukulele. He said, I'm afraid I might fall. His brother said to him, I'll hold your hand, you won't fall. So with his encouragement, Carl climbed to the top of the, the step stool. As high as he could reach, his hands were still a foot short of the ukulele. The top of the refrigerator was covered with cereal boxes, etc., and he could not have used it to climb higher. It would have taken someone about a foot taller than Carl to have reached the ukulele. The mother said she had had some strange incidents as a girl. There's a theory among some ufologists that the presumed extraterrestrial aliens are following certain families through their generations. The statement, the moon loves you, the stars love you, and light loves you, a two and a half year old boy would not be likely to make up. This along with all the other facts in this case, especially the inability of Carl to reach the ukulele, in my opinion, provides substantial evidence that a two and a half year old boy was visited by an unidentified intelligent being. August 27, 1979, Warren, Minnesota. Due to the wealth of physical evidence and the reliability of the prime witness, the case that unfolded in Warren, Minnesota is ranked among the most solid in its credibility. Not only were there multiple witnesses on the night of the sighting, but a similar experience transpired in the same area about a month later, according to another witness. Deputy Sheriff Val Johnson was on what seemed to be a routine night patrol on county, or country highways north of, of Warren, but what he ultimately encountered was anything but routine. Around 1.40 a.m., he saw a light through his side window. It was obviously not on the road and appeared too glaring to be from a car's headlight. He at first thought it might be a small plane on or very near the ground. He turned left on another road to try to get closer to the light in an effort to identify it. Suddenly, the light moved toward him, traveling so fast that it covered the mile and a half distance almost instantaneously. Johnson was blinded by the brilliance of the light and heard the crackle of glass breaking before he lost consciousness. A photo of where Johnson's vehicle skidded was furnished by the Marshall County Historical Society. When Johnson came to, his car was stalled where it had skidded across the highway. He felt sluggish and shaky and radioed headquarters at 2.19 a.m. to request assistance. Before long, another deputy arrived on the scene and called an ambulance. The doctor who examined Johnson found him to be in a mild state of shock. His eyes were irritated as if Johnson had suffered mild welder's burns and he couldn't tolerate any exposure to bright lights. Johnson's patrol car is now preserved in the Marshall County Historical Society Museum at Warren. The patrol car sustained a peculiar array of damage. The inside headlight on the driver's side was smashed, but the one to its immediate left remained intact. There was a flat bottom circular dent on the left side of the front hood about half an inch in diameter, shown here, close to the windshield. The partially shattered windshield had a crack in the driver's side of the windshield that ran from top to bottom, with four apparent points of impact. The electric clock was running 14 minutes slow, as was Johnson's wristwatch. The shaft of the roof antenna 
was bent at a 60 degree angle starting about six inches above its base. One of the bent antennas on Johnson's patrol car is shown here. The trunk antenna was bent over at 90 degrees, but only near the top. No damage occurred to the car's regular antenna on the front hood. Essentially, all the damage to the car occurred on the left or driver's side. Investigations occurred immediately, both by the, Shepherds, the Sheriff's Department and by investigators from the Center for UFO Studies. The police determined that Johnson's car traveled about 950 feet after the first round of damage occurred. As investigators set to work, they ruled out the possibility of a collision with another vehicle or a low-flying plane, and it was evident that Johnson wasn't merely playing a, a prank or advancing a hoax. What transpired was very real, and no clear cause emerged from the investigation. In addition, experts from Ford Motors, the vehicle was a 1977 Ford LTD, and a team of engineers from Honeywell examined various portions of the damage. After examining the windshield fractures, an expert from Ford, Meridian, Meridian French, noted that even after several days of reflection on the crack patterns and apparent sequence of, ev of events, I still have no explanation for what seemed to be inward and outward forces acting almost simultaneously. I can only conclude that all cracks were from mechanical forces of unknown origin. In addition, no cause could be found for the clock running slow, the peculiar antenna damage, or other physical traces. A metal expert said that it would have been impossible to bend the two antennas by hand in the manner that they were found, and he theorized that some unknown force field was responsible. Fortunately, Johnson's eyes healed quickly, and he suffered no lasting effects from the, the close encounter. Case 4038, October 29, 1979. This happened two months after Val Johnson's experience. The reporting witness was a military police sergeant. Here is his statement. This is a statement of the events that took place at approximately 2,200 hours on October 29, 1979. At the time of this incident, I was 25 years old and was a sergeant, E-5, military police officer, on active duty in the U.S. Army. I had deported Fort Rainwright, Alaska, a few days earlier and was driving to my next duty station, which was Fort Snelling, Minnesota. We had turned off Highway 29 in North Dakota and were headed east on Highway 1 in Marshall County, Minnesota. I was driving a 1977 Chevrolet. My wife Susan was in the car with me and we were just past the town of Alvarado when we observed an extremely bright light on the road approximately one mile ahead. After a minute or so, we determined that whatever it was, it was moving because we were not closing in on it. Now, being the cocky young military policeman that I was, I decided that I was going to find out what this light was. I accelerated to a high speed, I'm guessing close to 100 miles an hour. As I started closing on the light, I observed that the light was an extremely bright yellowish light, which appeared to be approximately four to six feet in diameter. It was above the center lines in the road and was about three to four feet above the road surface. As I got to within approximately 100 yards of the light, traveling at about 100 miles an hour, it suddenly came off the center lines into the middle of my lane and was coming right at me. I immediately locked up the brakes and swerved onto the shoulder of the roadway. Everything in the car was flying into the front seat. Instantly, the light was back to approximately one mile ahead of us again. Now I was ticked off. I took off after it again, determined to see what the light was. Again, 
as I got to within approximately 100 yards of the light, traveling at about 100 miles an hour, it suddenly came off the center lines into the middle of my lane and was coming right at me again. I immediately locked up the brakes and swerved on the shoulder of the roadway. And instantly, the light was back to approximately one mile ahead of us again. This time, I was able to observe that the bottom portion of the light merged into a brighter white light than the rest of it. It was so bright we had to squint our eyes when we were closing in on it. Now I was really ticked off. So I went after it for the third time with about the same results. However, this time I estimated that we came within 30 to 50 feet of the object. We almost hit it. At that point, we decided not to try that anymore. We followed it for a safe distance for a couple of more minutes. I turned my lights on and off and flashed my brights at it a few times, but it just kept heading down the road. Then it just disappeared. I thought that maybe it had gone out of sight down a hill, but there was no hill. About a mile later, we entered the town of Warren, Minnesota. As we continued past the town, we observed a bright light in our rearview mirror. We watched it for about a minute, then it disappeared. I don't know if it was what we chased or if it was just a car that was behind us. We talked about what had just happened, trying to figure out what the heck that object was. I didn't think a UFO was high on our list because one would think of UFOs as flying away, not playing a dangerous game of cat and mouse in Northwest Minnesota. What really ticks me off is that I had a good 35 millimeter camera in the car, but didn't think about it at all during this incident. My sister immediately said, it wasn't in Warren, was it? At that point, I got a knot in my stomach and the hair on the back of my neck rose with that goosebump chill thing. I said, what do you mean it wasn't in Warren? Since we had just drove about 3,000 miles and she nails this sighting to within a few miles. She said, tell me what you saw. So I told her what we had seen and she stated that a Marshall County deputy sheriff was hit by the UFO about two months ago. Now I was heading for my new military police unit at Fort Sheridan, Illinois, with duty at Fort Snelling. And I didn't want to get labeled as a loony, so I only told my friends and relatives about the UFO I had chased. A few months later, I heard the deputy sheriff, Val Johnson, being interviewed on a radio talk show. And I made up my mind that I would call him and talk with him. I called up to Marshall County and they said he worked at the Oslo Police Department. I called the Oslo Police Department and stated why I was calling. They called Val Johnson at home and he okayed them to give me his home phone. So I called him up and described him what had happened. He stated that of all the people that had reported UFO sightings up there, he was sure that I had chased the object that had hit him. He stated that as I was describing the incident, he was remembering the small details about the light, such as it being above the center line and it having a brighter white lower portion that he had never reported in his statements. I have often thought about what it was and why it would be playing cat and mouse with a car in northern Minnesota. The only theory I can come up with is as follows. If it was that some kind of extraterrestrial or extra dimensional beings were observing our civilization, they would surely be interested in what could hurt them. The Grand, For the Grand Forks Air Force Base and ICBM missile silos are not too far from there. Could it be possible that the object was monitoring the military base from that area? It being th about three to four feet above the road surface would give it vertical obstacle clearance and keep it below the radar screens. It being above the center line in the road would give it left and right side obstacle clearance. Vehicles like the, the sheriff's squad car and my car were probably minor inconveniences to its mission, requiring throwing a scare into the occupants if they got too close. That's the end of the sergeant's statement. Based on all I have learned about the activities in UFOs over the years, 
I think the sergeant's theory could be right on the mark. UFON's web, official website statement is, UFOs are real. We are not alone. Thank you for the privilege of presenting these cases to you. Hello, my name is Dean DeHarport, and I'm going to talk about four UFO cases from the case files of the Minnesota MUFON. Thank you for watching. Today, there is no longer any debate about whether UFOs are real. Our military has documented, and the New York Times has published radar and photographic records of unidentifying objects shadowing our military exercises off San Diego, off Norfolk, Virginia, and in the Middle East. Using the most advanced military radar and temperature tracing te technology, these objects were conclusively found to accelerate at rates that would kill any human being and move at speeds of more than 7,000 miles per hour, which is far beyond the capability of even our most advanced aircraft or that of any other country. I'm a certified field investigator for MUFON, and out of the 64 reports of UFOs that I have investigated over the past 20 years, I have judged 39 of them to be unidentified flying objects, or UFOs. Although UFOs rarely do harm, the people who report them are just like you and me, and they are deeply affected and often frightened by what they see. The emotional impact of UFOs, which is hard to fake, makes witness testimony that much more believable. I will share with you tonight, today four such reports that I have investigated. First one is a saucer-shaped object that was observed in Oak Grove, Minnesota on November 20, 1992. Now the photo there is, of the, is not what the witness saw. It's a generic uh, picture of a saucer-shaped UFO. It's the, one of the most famous UFO photos uh, available. It shows the McMinnville, Oregon UFO in 1951, and which shows the, the not only the disc but also the protrusion from the top of the of the UFO. The signal witness to this UFO sighting declined to talk very much about it until it was tw 2011, 19 years after her sight sighting, when she finally felt confident she was working with an organization, MUFON, that would respect her privacy. In 2011, I drove to the location of the sighting in Oak Grove, Minnesota, and interviewed the witness. She declined to identify any of the three other people she spoke with who witnessed the UFO that night. She told me I was home alone with a four-month-old baby, lying in bed, trying to fall asleep about 10 p.m., and I heard a weird noise outside. <clears throat> it sounded like the sound of a thin metal sheet makes when you quickly bend it back and forth in cold weather. Then she suddenly realized it wasn't cold out. She listened to it for approximately five more minutes, and then she was very afraid and pr prayed it would go away. I felt like I was being observed and felt compelled to get up and check. These strange feelings of compulsion when near a UFO are a common experience of many UFO witnesses, and as I said before, this is an indication that UFOs are real and not something the witness is making up. She reported, I saw the UFO out to the south and west facing windows in my sunroom. It was a saucer hovering above my driveway, just above a security light pole. The light from the saucer did not light up the surroundings very much. It looked dark grayish and blackish. It had a very dark, flat, metallic appearance, approximately 25 feet across, with five or six lights in a triangle pattern on the bottom. Its metallic finish had several lights, dark grayish or blackish in color. I did not observe any windows. I was really frightened. I felt I was being observed. Again, the emotional impact was, was overpowering. I was really wishing it would just go away, and after two to three long moments, it gradually rose about 20 feet higher in the sky. Then it hovered over my pasture for about a minute and moved slowly toward my barn. And after a minute over my barn, it shot straight west. As it moved several hundred feet away, it had the appearance of almost like a star, and then it quickly disappeared. I talked to my friend in St. Francis nearby, and some of her friends had seen it too, though not as close as I saw it. A reporter for a local news station called to see if I'd go on record and let him interview me, the, the witness said, but I declined. It has always stayed with me, and I decided recently it must be recorded. 
Neither, neither the witness nor her husband had anything to do with national security. There's no airports are near the site, and the witness seemed intelligent. Her verbal account was nearly identical to what she wrote online. She declined a local press interview shortly after the sighting occurred, so she was not seeking publicity. She came forward with her account because it had been bothering her for a long time, and MUFON presented a reliable, unobtrusive way to document what she had experienced. I so see no reason to disbelieve her account. Therefore, I have classified the sighting as an unknown, a UFO. The next sighting I'm going to talk about was a triangle-shaped sighting, a very common shape for UFOs. And this was near Sauk Rapids, Minnesota, just north of St. Cloud. The, the photo you see there is a famous photo that was taken of many triangular-shaped UFOs that were seen over Belgium in 1991. They were seen over a series of nights, three, two or three weeks, uh, almost every night by, by thousands of people. But this one is, is not, uh, we don't have a photo of the UFO that the witness saw in this case. The witness reported, I got home from my daughter's hockey game and went out back to check on things. I looked up and there it is, directly overhead, a triangular object silently floating across the sky until it faded into the trees and I lost it. The longitudinal size of the triangle was 30 to 100 feet and the structure wingtip to wingtip was about 15 to 50 feet. At its closest, the object was 20 feet or less from the witness, very close. It had several lights on it of varying intensities, the brightest of which were toward the front tip. After a few seconds, the object moved toward the munici small municipal airport about two miles away and disappeared behind the tree line. The triangle the witness saw was radically different from any other aircraft he had seen, commercial or military. There were no other reports of a similar object in the vicinity, and it was decidedly not a helicopter or a drone. Although, although the craft disappeared in the direction of a nearby airport, the witness was familiar with nighttime air traffic, which he said was rare, so it is very unlikely that the object was any kind of conventional aircraft. When I interviewed the witness, he seemed calm and spoke intelligently. He said the strange triangular object passed directly overhead, which left, left him honestly quite scared. I have seen weird things before, but nothing as definitive as this. Powerful emotional impact on this witness. The airport the UFO was moving toward when it disappeared is also a Black Hawk base or repair site. However, the Black Hawk is an advanced helicopter, and it was clear the object was not a helicopter. The speed of the object was far less than would be required to keep a winged aircraft aloft, and it had no red or green lights that are standard on civilian aircraft or on commercial aircraft. So it was not a conventional aircraft of any kind. The witness said he had seen other object in his dreams, but that doesn't discount from his credibility. For whatever reason, some people experience and dream of more strange phenomena than other people. Given the sober account of an apparently knowledgeable witness of an object so close to him, there is no reason to discount his testimony, and I therefore documented the object as a UFO. The next one is another triangle. This one was seen uh, near Waconia, Minnesota, about 12 miles west of Minneapolis. And this event happened in 1973, but was not investigated until the witness reported it to MUFON in 2016, 43 years after the sighting. Obviously, the sighting was a very significant event in this woman's life. The witness I interviewed, then age 82, and two other witnesses, now deceased and never interviewed about the event, were driving west about 9 p.m. from Eden Prairie toward Waconia when they saw a triangular-shaped object a mile ahead of them in the sky that was a casting a very bright, pulsating light on the ground. The witness immediately thought the object was a UFO. The object was in sight for several miles, and when they got to Waconia, it had slowed down and stopped, which enabled the witness to drive under the object and then about 100 feet overhead. It cast a circle of light approximately 50 feet in diameter. The light was so bright <clears throat> that the witness could barely see the road, but she accelerated and got ahead of it, and after that she could see neither the object nor the light cast by it. The witness was very excited and psychologically disoriented by the triangular object she saw, but suffered no physical symptoms of distress. After her sighting, she was concerned any time she saw any object in the sky that she didn't recognize. 
The date of the sighting, 1973, is before any triangular flying craft may have been secretly developed or tested by the U.S. military. And even if such an object had been developed, it is very unlikely it would have been tested in a Minneapolis suburb at low altitude. The fact that the object was paced the witness's car for several miles and shown a blindingly bright light is consistent with numerous other reports of UFOs. At this remove in time, it's impossible to know whether there was any moving object in the sky, such as a helicopter or airplane, that might have been misidentified by the witness as a UFO. But the low altitude and the highly anomalous appearance of such a bright light flying so slowly and so low of a triangular structure rules out any conventional explanation. Therefore, the object is judged to be an unknown aerial vehicle, again, a UFO. The witness was greatly relieved to finally find someone who would take her seriously and document her experience. The UFO had made a very strong impression on the witness, even after 43 years. She said she still continues to think very often about her experience. The fourth uh, case I'd like to talk about is a barge-like structure that was seen near Maple Grove, Minnesota on December 16th, 2008, a few miles north of Minneapolis. Now the photo there is just a typical barge. Again, there's no photograph of this object available. And the object was structurally similar, but didn't have all the protuberances that this uh, photo of this barge has on it. I interviewed the male witness at the place of his sighting on December 5th, 2016, eight years after the event. He had kept meticulous notes of his experience and was sufficiently affected by his experience to fill in the long, detailed MUFON form. The witness was driving northwest on Highway 81 on Maple Grove at about 8.15 p.m. when he saw a very bright flash approximately one mile ahead of him toward the northwest. It occurred to him, <coughs> to, occurred to him that the flash was similar to the flash when the ship on the Battlestar Galactica TV show. He noted that the flash was immediately replaced by a very bright light. Other UFO witnesses have described such flashes becoming lights and ultimately UFOs. It has been speculated by scientists that this is some sort of break in the space-time continuum, possibly developed by an alien civilization. After a few seconds of remaining stationary, the bright light moved a distance a long distance, very quickly, at least a mile, in an arc motion toward his rear. Incredibly, this moment took only a couple of seconds to complete. The light now mysteriously manifested as a solid object hovering above a factory building about 50 feet ahead of him and only 100, 50, only 100 feet overhead. It had what the witness described as a very sturdy barge-like appearance that reminded him of a railroad box, boxcar. Not surprisingly, the witness experienced a feeling that something was unusual and drove to his girlfriend's house and back, which took only a few minutes. When he returned, he stopped about 100 feet southwest of the same intersection, and the air, ob, airborne object was then almost directly over the intersection, still about 100 feet overhead. The witness was able to get a very good look at the object. It was close enough that he felt he could hit it with a baseball. It was rectangular in shape, about 100 feet long, 40 feet wide, 15 feet high, and had three round lights, one on each end and one near the center of the craft. The structure had a number of antenna-like protuberances coming out of the top side, three dull substructures and three dull round lights, one on each end and one near the center. It made absolutely no sound. The witness was obviously taking good notes uh, or had kept good notes of his experience. When the witness realized what he was looking at, he suddenly became very frightened. Here's the emotional impact again, and got away as quickly as possible. According to Twin Cities Dark Radio show host Dave Schroeder, four UFO witnesses on his program and the years following the sighting, that approximately 15 other cars stopped and gazed at the object at the intersection where the incident occurred. What do these sightings mean? <laughs> they mean that there is tangible evidence that thousands of credible people 
have seen large numbers of extraordinary flying objects that our government and our military establishment is just beginning to formally admit to. The MUFON database alone contains detailed descriptions of thousands of credible UFO sightings documented in detail by trained investigators over the past 50 years. It would seem that such strong evidence of such mind-bending objects as UFOs would generate well-financed government investigations by our top scientists and enormous speculation and discussion among our leading journalists. However, it seems that most human minds are simply so frightened by the potentially existential threat of an alien culture that they reflexively ignore UFOs and ridicule people who take them seriously. Thank you.